Hello and welcome to One to Grow On, a show where we dig into questions about agriculture and try to understand how food production impacts ourselves and our world. I'm Hallie Casey and I studied and currently work in agriculture. And I'm Chris Casey, Hallie's dad, and I don't know any of this stuff. Each episode, we pick an area of agriculture or food production that confuses a lot of people, including me, and try to get Hallie to explain it to us so that we can understand it. And this week, we are focusing on the Green Revolution. Because you say you want a revolution, (laughs) well, Well, you know. know. (laughs) We can all, I don't know the rest of the song. We all want. To change the change world. the world <laughs> yes okay i do know that yeah so the green revolution this is where everything became green absolutely yeah that is that's what it is that's what the revolution is it was the revolution Damn. of green color before, before that we didn't that, have the color green it was it was brown grass and brown tree leaves and brown everything and then chlorophyll was invented and now it's green yeah and it was a real revolutionary moment <laughs> what don't i know um what what do you know do you have you ever heard of the green revolution i before? have not this is actually the first time i've heard of the green Re- revolution i have i have no idea what this is what why is it a revolution okay um why is it the green revolution is it people like quote unquote going green mm-hmm. yeah I, I have no idea this is this is uh, a mystery to me. This is so surprising to me because when when I was meeting with Catherine to do the research for this, I asked her the same question, like, do you know what the Green Revolution is? And she did not really. She also thought it was like people going green and like the, the eco movement. But it's it's something that's so ubiquitous within the ag industry that it's like not even described ever like you don't i mean i think i got maybe one half of a lecture where it was like here's what the green revolution was but it's just something that's so like it's just so fundamental to all of agriculture that it's just why i i forgot i I honestly didn't know that people didn't know what it was so when you're talking to one of your industry friends and you say ever since the green revolution they just bam they know exactly what you're talking about yeah 100 percent. it's like a chemist said like ever since no, I don't know any chemistry dates. Uh, ever ever since, uh, you know, the Bohr model was improved on or something. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, yeah, ever since we had quantum theory or... So it's, it's kind of like that for the ag industry. It's 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 just ubiquitous. All right. If I ever, like, speed through something and I, you don't understand it, feel free to pull me back because I might do that. <laughs> okay. Good to know. So in the 1960s... Um, we had land grant colleges, right, which we talked about in the extension episode. And specific colleges and researchers formed what were called CGIARs, which were consulted. They made cigars? I've, every single time I read it in class <laughs> on a PowerPoint, I was like, oh, cigars. Nope, not cigars. So what is it? It would have been so much easier. You could have called it like the Consultative International Group for Agricultural Research, but they didn't. It could have actually been Cigar, but maybe they didn't want that since it was kind of like a cabal of old white men inventing agriculture. Anyways, so it's called the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. So they opened in 1971. They still exist today, but these groups, like it says, they were international. So a lot of them were based in Central America and Mexico. Some were based in Asia. And the goal was just to have research that was focused on a specific crop. So it was like international research. It was a place where the leading researchers for certain crops and certain systems could like come and do intensive research. And it was international. So it would be available to everyone. I mean, that sounds kind of cool. Uh, right? Just say, hey, let's all <laughs> let's all learn about this thing now. I mean, there's a little uh, secret organization feel to it, like this, yeah. you know, these kind of uh, industry moguls saying, hey, let's let's uh, organize and research. But I mean, in reality, it's I don't know. It's, it sounds interesting. Yeah, it's honestly so basic. So the, it got formed because a bunch of researchers sat down and was like, we're gonna need more food. Let's put a lot of money and energy into fixing this problem that will, one, make us no money, and two, help a lot of very poor people. And then they just did it. And there's a lot of issues with the Green Revolution, but, like, that idea that, like, the scientific and the philanthropic communities of the world could just get together and just solve a huge problem 
that was not going to make any money, that was not going to like help anyone who was economically enfranchised. It wasn't really going to help developed countries. It was a, it was basically getting together and putting a lot of effort and money towards a very specific, clear effort and idea that would help poor people to not die of starvation. It's it's kind of a wild idea when you like think about it. That's amazing. That's yeah. Like wow. Why why don't I know about this? I know. This is so cool. Can you imagine if something like that happened for like climate change, where like all the governments and I know you don't really know what it is yet because I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But like if, you know, all these governments and research organizations and granting organizations came together and was like, oh, here's the solution. We'll just do this. And they then just did it over the period of like 20 years. Wow. Yeah, that would be cool. I mean, it almost sounds like open source software where a bunch of people, except that it's individuals and, and companies saying, yeah. hey, let's all make this software together that we can all use for free. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Yeah. So so I. I should probably tell you what it actually is because I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But it is similar to open source software, and I'll come back to that. So so in, in the 1950s like, and 60s, people were really worried about population um, increasing and people not having enough food, a huge population coming along, and it increasing famine and it increasing stresses on the environment. Um, there's a really famous book that was released called The Population Bomb, which has since been proven to be mostly fallacy not a lot of actual fact in there, but it was basically theorizing that if we continued on the current path that we were on, that it would bring like widespread destruction to the environment and to our food system. Very similar to today. But there's a really, if you want to know more about like the population rhetoric, there's a really interesting outside in episode that was just recently dropped a couple of weeks ago. That's super duper good. Very well reported. Link in the show notes. So in response to this, these scientists got together and they created these groups. Basically, these researchers came together and they were like, we need to form these international groups. And then foundations like the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation showed up and were like, we're going to give you a whole lot of money to do this. So basically, each of these different groups would get together and they would breed things. They would breed rice or potatoes or wheat or maize, and they would try and make it more productive. And they would try and improve the breeds and make them more resistant to disease or to grow better or faster or whatever it is. And and what we got was high yielding varieties of foods, which was great, which was super duper great. So far, so good. <laughs> we got yields of things like wheat, maize, rice that were able to produce a lot more each growing season. Okay. One of the most famous scientists name was Norman Borlaug. Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for his work in breeding. So he bred wheat and maize mostly in Mexico and he invented some new ways of breeding and he also created some really really productive breeds of wheat and maize. The method that he created for breeding, which I think was a factor in why they awarded him the Nobel Peace Prize, um, they called it shuttle breeding. So shuttle breeding was innovative because what he would do is he would be able to take wheat and he would move it from place to place, like physically move the seeds from place to place. So he would like plant it one place in the summer. And then when it got too cold there in the summer, he would move it somewhere else and grow it somewhere else in the winter season. So this had a couple of different pros. Like one, you were able to get two generations of a breed per year. And then two, you were also breeding in this resiliency to different soils, to different climates. So so it was a really revolutionary way to get new, hardier, more productive seed faster. I was going to say, it sounds like a, sort of a sped up way of, of method of selective breeding. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. Um, okay. But it's just you're able to do it with one more factors and two over a shorter period of time. Nice. Yeah. So he, Norman Borlaug is a huge, huge name in agriculture. He won the Nobel Peace Prize, but there is also like, there's an institute that's been named after him. There's a bunch of like prizes that are given out in his honor. Like he is, he is a huge figure in agriculture because he is credited with basically I mean him and then some other like scientists who don't have names but like he is he is the figurehead for the green revolution which is credited with feeding 1 billion people or saving 1 billion people from starving I guess it's kind of the Vince Lombardi of agriculture 
Um, Vince Lombardi was the coach of the Green Bay Packers in Super Bowl One. He's the first person to win the Super Bowl, uh, coach a Super Bowl winning football team. Everyone knows who he is. <laughs> when, er, all football fans know who he is. Sort of like all agriculture people know who uh, Borlaug is. There it's an go. analogy. It's a good analogy, yeah. Except for that one of them did save a billion people from starving and one of them won a football game. No offense to football. Yeah, we won't get any blowback from that. <laughs> I, I, feel like prob- I feel like there might not be a lot of crossover from our listenership and diehard Vince Lombardi fans. I could be wrong. Probably not. Probably not. But, you know, he's <laughs> the point is he's uh, kind of a, a very well-known figure in the agriculture industry. Yes, he's very well known. And he's kind of seen as a figurehead, um, not because he was the only one doing the work, but because he did a lot of the most important work. Right. So I, I don't know if you saw this tweet. It's in the show notes. Can you see it? I see the link. Yes. This is my best tweet I've ever made. It's from a meme that was a couple of months ago and no one liked this tweet and it's so funny <laughs> and i will include a link to it in the show notes <laughs> dad can you read the tweet for us sure okay um so marvel says infinity war is the most ambitious crossover <laughs> event in history me me being hallie casey uh <laughs> posts a quote from something that i don't know what it is saying 1966, the variety was first introduced in the Philippines and India. Promoters such as the IRRI and farmer benefactors of IR8 have called it Miracle Rice and celebrate it for fighting famine. IR8 was the eighth of 38 crossbred rice varieties in a 1962 experiment by IRRI. It was a cross of high-yield rice variety from Indonesia, Peta, and a dwarf variety from China, Digu Wanjen, the semi-dwarf... Okay, yeah, and it goes on. But basically, there was a... <laughs> about crossover rice that i guess is a high it's a miracle rice it's a and miracle it rice famine. yep oh, oh my god i'm hysterical i i still think about that tweet <laughs> it's so funny uh so so yeah there were there were really famous varieties of rice and wheat and maize that were super productive um there was one uh famous variety of rice called ir8 um, there was one famous variety of wheat called dwarf spring wheat. And basically basically what it did was it helped people not starve. That's uh, important. Well, I think that's a good time. Real quick, we will jump into the break. Welcome to the middle of the episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of One to Grow On. We are here with me, Dad, and also producer Catherine is here. Hi. We just finished recording our special Patreon holiday episode. If you would like to hear this episode, you can become a patron for $1 a month. And it is fun. Y'all. It's really fun. We had a lot of fun <laughs> doing it. We had so much fun. If you would like to become a patron in the future, but maybe not right now or immediately, uh, this will be in the back feed, so you can listen to it later on if you are doing that later. Yeah, holiday season can be tough, but if maybe you have a spare dollar in January or February, then I guess it is technically January now, then you can totally scroll back and listen to it anytime. Thanks to uh, Josh, our new patron. Yeah, and thank you to Lindsay, our star fruit patron, who you'll hear about every single episode. Thank you to Virginia, my mother-in-law, for the sweet new microphone that we're recording on right now. Thank you very much. And um, also, quick announcement, I'm going to be at PodCon in Seattle, and if anyone else is going to be there, tweet at me or the show and we can meet up. I would love to chat. Other than that, I think that's pretty much it. I hope everyone had a happy new year last night. And yeah, back to the episode. Back to the episode. So before we started recording the episode, I read up a little bit on the Green Revolution. Mm -hmm. And I noticed it was about creating heartier uh, varieties of of various cereals, which, you know, wheat is a cereal. Mm -hmm. And... I found I found this fun internet list. So according to some list on Mashable, the first manufactured breakfast cereal had to be soaked overnight before serving it. And this was like this was in 1863. Um, a dietary reformer named Dr. James Caleb Jackson invented granula, G R A N U L A, which was uh, nuggets of rich graham flour. And it was uh, made from like dough and broken to little pieces. Oh, God. A guy named Dr. Kellogg uh, also invented a similar cereal at the same time, but changed it to granola after Jackson threatened him with legal action. Oh, wow. Uh, 
Yeah. That's so interesting. And now we have Nature Valley granola bars. Oh my God, that's fascinating. That's a really good fact, Dad. Thank you very much. I found it all by myself <laughs> with the help of Google and all of the thousands of people that wrote that software. Da 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 da. Nature facts. <laughs> So anyway, where were we? Um, so so yeah, so the Green Revolution happened. It saved a lot of people from starving. A- approximately one billion, according to the estimates. There were some effects from that. I'm gonna say whenever you have something like this, there's there's always a but. Yeah, yeah. So it it required a lot of fertilizer. So basically, what happened was these scientists went out and they were like, okay, great, we have more effective seeds. Fantastic. Let's go take these to farmers. So they went out, they took them to farmers. They said, here's your seeds. Here's how to grow them. Right. And how to grow them was pretty much how we were growing things in the U.S., which was like a lot of fertilizer with pesticides, with herbicides, conventional farming. So if you didn't have access to those things, the seeds did not grow as well. And in in a lot of cases, it helped large scale farmers who had access to capital and could buy inputs like fertilizer. And it did not help smaller farmers so it would widen the wealth gap between larger farmers and smaller farmers that's weird that's when you when you talk about they're making hardier seeds you mm. would think that uh more fertilizer wouldn't be part of the equation well At least i would yeah so so what fertilizer is typically is is a lot of nitrogen right we talked about that in the haberbosch episode and what we get when we get seeds is a lot of protein, right? So like if you're growing soybeans, the actual beans themselves are, it's a lot of protein. Um, and in things like wheat bran, there's a fair amount of protein as well. So when you add like seed kernels, so what a lot of these these seeds were doing is you would be able to grow a plant that would be able to grow more actual seeds on it. So you'd be able to grow more soybeans or you'd be able to grow more actual like wheat seeds on a wheat seed panicle then you will need more nitrogen to actually physically form those seeds right on a on a wheat seed whatical a panicle it's like the little panicle it's like the little thing that holds the seeds like on you know on the top of a wheat Uh, okay i'll take your word for it the point is the point is you need more nitrogen yeah and and sometimes so there were different things that they bred for they would breed for having more seeds per plant in wheat they bred them shorter because what would happen is the wheat would be too tall and then the wind would come and it would blow it over so it would be a lot harder when you were like going through with your machete to like cut it if it was like lying on the ground so they actually bred it physically shorter they would breed it so that it was a bit tougher against some diseases in some cases there were different things that they would breed it for but they were breeding them within the conditions of added nitrogen, of pesticides, of herbicide control. That That's kind of what they were bred ideally for. So it makes sense that if you're not growing them in those circumstances, that they're just not going to do as well. Right. It did have the benefit of decreasing the amount of, of land that we had to put into agriculture. So we have to often clear land from forest or savanna to put into agricultural production and since we started making more food per unit of land, there was a period of time where we didn't have to do that as much, which was a plus. Okay. It had the unfortunate side effect of when they went in and they talked to farmers about you should grow this seed instead of the other seed. There was no method to save the seeds that they were already growing. So we lost a lot of diversity in what people were growing And we lost that diversity within the species. So, like, this was a big thing in rice. Like, we lost a lot of rice biodiversity in the Green Revolution, which then makes it, one, harder to then breed rice if you don't have as much biodiversity to pull from. And two, you bring in, like, questionable ethics issues because rice is a really culturally important crop for a lot of Indian farmers. Uh, so you were kind of unable to have those traditional seeds. So that can be kind of an issue if you're talking about people who have a cultural tie to their like heirloom varieties. Um, but it had the positive benefit and you can kind of see I'm going negative positive here. It had the positive benefit of it took nearly a thousand years for wheat yields to increase from 0.5 metric tons per hectare to two metric tons per hectare. But because of the Green Revolution, it took 40 years to climb from two 
to six metric tons per hectare. Well, that's a that's a pretty good increase. And it's huge. It's so, exponential in such a short amount of time. So I always wonder what what is a hectare? How much space is a hectare? What what measurement would you like it in? How about acres? Two point four seven acres. That's a really weird measurement, but okay. The point well, is, it's it's divisible in meters, if I remember correctly. So it makes more sense. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, now I like it. Yeah. So we were able to increase food productivity uh, exponentially um, in a short period of time. Yeah, pretty rad. It did have the downside of the Green Revolution moved a lot of farmers from subsistence farming with heirloom varieties to commercial farming with bread varieties, right? Which we talked about earlier that these bread varieties needed additional inputs which was fine at first, but has led to, we now have a lot of small farmers who are trapped in like a cycle of debt where they cannot grow their seeds without buying nitrogen and pesticides and herbicides. So they have to take out loans against their farm to buy these things. And it's, it's, it's honestly led to some really, really sad things. And I don't, I don't want to blame the Green Revolution entirely for that. But the implementation process of the Green Revolution, how they connected with farmers and what they've recommended to farmers is correlated with with this kind of rise in cyclical debt for a lot of small-scale farmers in developing countries. J- just when I was becoming a fan. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to like yo-yo you. It was good, it was bad, it was good, it was bad. From the 1960s to the 1990s, the population on the continent of Asia grew by 60%, but in that time rice production grew and rice prices actually fell. Even though there was more pressure from the demand, the supply grew enough so that the prices were able to fall, which is like really important because otherwise a lot more people would have starved. Yeah. So the population increases and it becomes, but it's still cheaper, which I mean, there could be some correlation there as well. I mean, who knows? Uh, I know there's a whole lot of different factors that go into population growth, but cheap Mm. food is one of them. But when you have a big population, you need cheap food. Yeah, for sure. And then the other thing was that they did a lot of work in Latin America and in Asia, but they did not really do any work in sub-Saharan Africa. So Africa as a continent did not really feel a lot of the effects of the Green Revolution. There was not a lot of hunger alleviated in Africa. Um, There was not a lot of varieties bred for growing in Africa. And they just didn't get the same extension and the same resources that Latin America and Asia did in this specific movement. Well, that's unfortunate. Yes, it is unfortunate. And I'm sure we could speculate on the on the reasons why that was. But there's definitely areas in Africa that, well, at least from what Sally Struthers told me in the 80s, (laughs) could definitely use some improvement in agricultural infrastructure. Yeah. And there there, there are different, you know, areas of thought about this. Some people argue that sub-Saharan Africa should have been a part of the Green Revolution. And a lot of people died because it wasn't. Some people argue that because it wasn't part of the Green Revolution, Sub-Saharan Africa is able to kind of define the way that its agriculture sector is growing in ways that it's harder for parts of Asia and Latin America to do because they didn't have the influence from this specific movement. But that said, there was still a lot of other agricultural development going on in Africa. It just wasn't the Green Revolution. So there's, there's mixed opinions on that. It seems a little bit short-sighted on behalf of the scientists. Uh, Right. Yeah. Um, So this increase in production allowed for farmers to exit the agricultural workforce, which generally, when you're talking about economics, is a good thing. They were able to go and get different and better jobs. We, We also learned some hard lessons from it. The implementation was not great. And we do a lot more things when we talk about agricultural development now, like participation from the farmers when we're figuring out what the actual solution should be. So with the Green Revolution, it was a lot of a scientist or extension agent would go into a community and say, well, stop what you're doing. Do this instead. And that never goes wrong. Yeah, yeah. They would just prescribe unilaterally what the farmer needed to do and change, which, as I mentioned, has led to some issues. Uh, So one thing that we really try and focus on now is asking the farmers, working with the farmers to actually develop the solution and also coming up with different solutions and different policies for farmers in different areas and of different sizes. 
because the Green Revolution really affected farmers in different geographic regions and of large scale versus small scale farmers really differently. So we, we try and take that into account when we're creating new agricultural development projects and technology and policies. It's always good to include the people that are, that are going to be directly affected in, yeah, the, in you, the conversation. You would think, right? And amazingly, it took Western science so long to figure that out. I think it kind of ties back to the idea that like farming is unskilled labors and farmers don't need to be smart in order to farm. And so they shouldn't be included in the conversation because scientists are smart. And so they've got it figured out and they'll just tell the farmers what the answer is. But that's like such a simplistic and reductive view of what agriculture actually is. Yeah. And. I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of farmers out there that can get by a lot better than a lot of scientists. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I mean, farming is really hard. Well, that's that's all I have about the Green Revolution. Do you have any questions about what we went over? I don't. I mean, I think the takeaway is um, it brought us pretty far in terms of, of increasing the efficiency of food production. But, mm-hmm. I mean, there were certainly some uh, negative side effects, and I suspect we're still dealing with a lot of those. But you know, um, live and learn. And hopefully uh, the ways we find uh, increased food production in the future will not not have all the bad and but have just more of the good. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good wrap up. I want to underline that like a billion people didn't starve. I mean, that's not nothing. It's not. And there's a lot of critiques about the Green Revolution. I mean, there's there's always going to be issues with things. So if you're only critiquing something then you're kind of critiquing the idea of progress. Like, progress will always be flawed. We will always have problems that were unforeseen. Things will always be short-sighted in some way. And I don't want to diminish what the problems were because a lot of people felt some really real consequences of this project being short-sighted. But I also want to recognize that, I mean, yes, we can complain about what happened because of it, but I don't think that we should disregard it, which often happens it was a really significant advancement and a lot of people did not die because of it wisdom nuggets from hallie casey wisdom nuggets wisdom nuggets thanks for listening to this episode of want to grow on If you would like to support the show, you can rate and review us on iTunes or consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash one to grow on pod. If you'd like to connect with us, find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or at our website at one to grow on pod.com. This show is hosted by me, Hallie Casey, and Chris Casey. It's produced by Catherine RJ and Hallie Casey. Our music is Something Elated by Broke for Free, and our show art is by Mariah Coley. Be sure to check out the next episode in two weeks. Until then, keep on growing. Bye, everybody.